Five, four, three, two, one, fire! It can't be called routine. It's never routine aboard one of these ships where so much power is placed in the trust of so few. Still, there's a relaxed atmosphere that comes from experience. These men are seasoned, confident in themselves and in the success of their weapon system. Five years ago, there was one ship out here. Now there are more than a dozen. And every few weeks, another vessel joins the FBM fleet. The system has worked so well that every cruise has met its objectives. Meanwhile, the Polaris submarine construction program approached completion. Recent months have been marked by numerous launchings and commissions. and the keel was laid on the 41st and final ship in the planned FBM series. What now for Polaris as it approaches completion? Can we say mission accomplished? Become complacent with the assurance there's a mighty nuclear deterrent at work to maintain our security? The truth is, no modern weapon system can contribute to our security without a continuing expenditure of human energy to man it, to maintain it, and to modify and develop it to meet changing requirements. The dramatic development of Polaris is now history, but the job of keeping it ready, ready as an ever effective deterrent, is a story that never ends. Holy Luck, overseas base for submarine squadron 14. Only one ship operated from this base once. Now several ships put in here. They are resupplied, serviced. They exchange crews, and after a brief stay, return to an assigned patrol area. Getting acquainted with the world above the sea, this crew has been relieved from weeks of underseas duty as part of the blue and gold two-crew system. After a few days in the land of tartan, pipes, and heather, it's back to the States, to families, and to preparations for another patrol. And in other harbors, the pattern of Holy Lock is repeated. At Rota, Spain, a mobile floating base serves the brood of swift mobile missile carriers that quietly arrive and depart from patrols in the Atlantic and Mediterranean. In 1962, the momentum of construction began to be felt. There were launchings, trials, commissionings, and shakedowns at an increasing tempo. Christine Lafayette, the Lafayette. Another date was added to the chronology of naval events, May 25, 1964. On this day, the USS Daniel Boone reported to the Pacific Fleet. 
another vast ocean area was opening up for dispersal of our growing nuclear defense. She was the first submarine assigned to a new squadron based at Apra Harbor, Guam. Not only new bases, but new technology are part of the advancing Polaris program. This is the A-3, a vast improvement over the 1,200-mile range A-1 weapons carried by the George Washington class, or the 1,500-mile range A-2 carried by other FBM ships. The A-3 has a range of 2,500 miles. Yet it's more powerful rocket motors, it's more accurate guidance system, and powerful warhead are designed to fit in the tubes of the original FBM submarine. The submarines at anchor here are of a later class of ship. Built from the keel up as Polaris vessels, they are 1,400 tons heavier and 45 feet longer than the first class of FBM submarine. A Polaris submarine is readied for sea. This is the climactic activity that takes place before it can become a functioning weapon system, performing its intended role as a nuclear deterrent. Missiles are not its only cargo. There are thousands of other items needed to sustain its two-month voyage. Some are necessities of life. Others contribute to the simple pleasures and diversions of off-duty hours. All items, from an A3 missile to a cribbage board, represent a complex logistic operation. This is Polarisville, the Polaris Missile Facility Atlantic at Charleston, South Carolina. It is the key to the missile logistics problem. This base was conceived long before there was even one submarine or 16 missiles, but with full knowledge that by 1967, there would be over 40 submarines and a requirement for more than 600 ready missiles. Major assemblies of the Polaris missiles arrive here from many places. They are inspected, stored, and, when needed, assembled and tested. The anticipated growth of the Polaris fleet required the construction of a similar facility to serve the Pacific area. Bangor, Washington, is Polarisville West. Here, missile components are assembled, tested, and stored. Experience and know-how is being gained to meet the fast-growing logistic and ordnance needs of the Pacific Squadron. The remarkable development and production of this hardware tends to obscure the equally impressive accomplishments of training crews that man Polaris ships. The first crews were hand-picked from the fleet trained at plants and laboratories engaged in the project. As the original ships took form on the ways, simultaneously crews were taking shape. At commissioning, these crews were ready to operate the ships as seasoned and as experienced as was possible under the unique circumstances. From its very inception, the directors of the nuclear power program realized their need for qualified technicians. Accelerated courses in such subjects as mathematics, physics, thermodynamics, reactor principles, and nuclear power technology would have to be administered on the college level by competent instructors. New schools had to be established as well, such as this one for FBM system training at Dam Neck, Virginia. Every technique, including the use of simulators, 
is utilized to facilitate what is perhaps the most intensive, most sophisticated technical training ever given to Navy men. Many aspects of it are of postgraduate college level. The irony of this training is that it is not adequate. Why? Simply because of the dynamic evolution of Polaris and the rapidly changing technology of the world in which we live. The Polaris submariner is highly trained for his job. Yet while he's at sea, the technology of weapon systems advances at incredible speed. As a result, these men between cruises must undergo refresher and advanced training to keep pace with the ever-changing weapon system they are operating. One of these schools is located at Pearl Harbor. Good morning, gentlemen. My name is Patterson. My assistant, Dan Boise. You men are here this morning off the Daniel Moon at the Pearl Harbor submarine escape tank to learn the proper method of individual escape from your submarine using the stanky hood. Pull the jacket down over the top of your head. This is the method you will use when you leave the lock. Put your right foot out, I'll charge the jacket. Okay, you take a deep one and go. Sit right down on the hatch combing, put your left hand up, take hold of the hatch combing, step out, turn and face the lock, put your head back, exhale half your breath, release the grip from the hatch combing, bring your hands over your head and interlock them, say ho, 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 take a shallow breath, say ho, 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 the rest of the way to the surface. At sea again, the submariner may use much of his leisure time for more education. Many crewmen, while at sea, are taking college-level courses under the sponsorship of Harvard University and the University of California. There is no approximation involved in specifying the routes when the quadratic form can be factored. Some engaged in specialized study for advancement in rate. To become masters of their profession is a real incentive to these men. But they know mastery is a relative matter, for there are always new challenges in sight. One of the most amazing is Poseidon, the missile that will someday replace the earlier Polaris. Poseidon illustrates the dynamic character of the FBM system, its adaptability to changing requirements. Poseidon will be packaged to fit standard missile tubes, but it will carry a larger booster for increased flexibility against a broader range of possible targets and an even more accurate guidance system. The greater missile range gives the submarine a much larger sea area to operate in, making enemy detection even more difficult. The improved missile accuracy makes enemy hardened missile sites more vulnerable than ever before. Thus, the Polaris program continues. Vital, flexible, energetic. George Washington, the prototype vessel, had reached old age by weapon standards. However, this ship's days are far from over. She is now undergoing overhaul and will soon be joining the fleet updated in equipment, missiles, and capability. Her service life extended for many years. 41 submarines after its inception, the Polaris program continues to respond to the changing needs and advancing technology of the times.